Welcome to Authors Revealed. I'm Becky Anderson. I am so excited. Graham Simpson is here from Australia with his new book. You may know him from The Rosie Project, which was a number one New York Times bestseller. And the new novel is The Best of Adam Sharp. Graham, welcome back to Naperville and Anderson's. It's so great to have you here. Well, it's really nice to be back. Yeah, and I think it was, was it four years ago when Rosie came out, the Rosie Project came out, or was it three three years ago? See, so, yeah, I lose track of time. It, w it would be just on four, four years, years ago in the US, yeah, yeah. that's right, uh, 2013. Yeah, and you're here, so congratulations on your new novel, The Best of Adam Sharp. So we're going to talk about that book, but then I, we also have some, I have some questions about, you know, The Rosie Project and some some wonderful things coming up for Adam Sharp as well. And not to mention the book in between. And the book in between. Which the is The Rosie, Rosie Effect, Effect, the sequel yeah. of The Rosie Project, yeah. Yeah. So, um, so this book was out in Australia in September, so it's been about eight months and only here, not even quite a week in, in yeah. the States here. So what have you been hearing from all your fans and your readers who love The Rosie Project and The Rosie Well, Effect? some of them love it and some of them hate it, okay? <laughs> it is way more divisive. I mean, The Rosie Project, I, I would get uh, emails from book clubs saying, this is the most popular, most highly rated book that we've ever done. I felt pretty good about that. Um, Adam Sharp is much more divisive, primarily because it deals with some questions of infidelity and so on, and morality, and puts people into very tough situations. And there are people out there who, who don't want to read a book which has infidelity in it. I mean, particularly people who read only romance. I mean, right, sure. in some ways, The Rosie Project is a romance, although I'd call it a love story. Yeah, but right. if you're a romance reader exclusively, you can read The Rosie Project and say, oh, it's different, but okay. But you're not going to necessarily enjoy it. You know, the best of Adam Sharp because it's not in that place. Yeah. But I've got people who love it who say, oh, so much better than the Rosie books. And people at the other end who say, but what are you doing? Go back and write another Rosie. Yeah, but see, they're very different. They're very different books. They're very different novels and very oh, different subjects. Well, well, yeah. well they are. Yeah. But at the, at the other end of it, um, they're written by the same guy. They're a first person male point of view. Right, right. They're very much about love and relationships. Um, and I hope they've got a, a dose of comedy in them. So. Yeah. You know, it's still me. Yeah. And what I loved about this book was the music. Oh, the music and the songs. And, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. But I was wondering, you know, sitting down, and I know this book was a short story originally. Is that right? Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. but was it hard to sit down and, and put it into a full-fledged novel after the huge success you had with both Rosie books? Was it hard or was it daunting in any way? Well, you, you? Know, you know, I actually wrote, drafted this between the Rosie books. It was going to be my yeah. second book and then I changed my mind and decided we'd do The Rosie Effect, the sequel. So it sat untouched for, for five, or four or five years. Oh, wow. It would have been four years. Yeah. And then I came back to it um, with my you know, more developed writing skills. <laughs> Uh, and was still happy with the story, but did did a lot of work on it, right. uh, obviously. But look, no, it wasn't. It, look, it was a hard book to write. Mm -hmm. It's a much more complicated, layered book than the rosy than the rosy books. Um, particularly, the motivations of people are, are quite complicated. Um, and you know, I still wanted it to be an engaging read. I mean, my first rule is, you've got to engage the reader. I, you know, even people who I mentioned that some people don't like the book, make no mistake, but almost nobody throws it aside. Mm -hmm. I've got them engaged, they read till the end and they say, oh, I really hated that Angelina woman <laughs> or whatever it might be. Yeah, right. Well, okay, go talk about it at the book club. But if I've kept your, their attention, That's right. th then then I've got a page turn and I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Yeah. Um, so look, it was the hardest book to write and it will probably always be the hardest book to write was The Rosie Project yeah, because yeah. I was learning so much as sure, I went. Sure, sure. Um, so this book has a little bit of basis in your own personal life. They all do. I know they do, but this one, kind of the, the relationship you have with your own wife, Anne, a little yeah. bit. So tell us a little bit about that because that that was some of the seeds that got the original short story and then the, the okay, novel. Okay, so what, what, what actually happened here was that um, 
my wife and I have been married for almost 30 years, but before um, we started dating, she was dating this Englishman who'd come out to Australia on a working vacation and they'd met and they fell in love and all this sort of stuff. And he and I met a couple of times and we didn't like each other. You know, we were love rivals, <laughs> so, you know, fighting <laughs> over the you know, 20s yeah, sure. or whatever. So, yeah, right. you know, and um, anyway, uh, in the end I won, so there. Um, but he went back to the UK and she stayed in touch with him, eventually by email. It was pre-email, you know, letters occasionally, just keeping in touch and then email. And he, he was married, she was married to me, no problem, what could go wrong? And then we were on vacation in France and she gets an email from him saying he split up with his wife. And she says to me, hey, we should invite him to stay with us. He's just across the channel. He should come over for a few nights. I said, you've got to be kidding. <laughs> said, but right. but yeah, come on, she says, you know, you're a man. You know, this is a guy who's hurting. Where's the solidarity? I said, okay. Long story short. That's very generous of you. Well, that's very nice of you to say that. I hope my wife is watching this. Yeah, <laughs> okay. right, right. So, um, but he came to stay and he actually stayed for quite a few nights. And look, he was terrific. He, he understood the situation. It all went well. But I asked myself, because writers do these things, you know, what if? What if he'd, um, he'd, he'd come over, he looked at Anne and he said, oh my God. And she looked at him and said, it was always you. Yeah. What might have happened then? So, so that was the that was one of the seeds. Sure. There's always more than one seed that you know. I think that that's probably a terrible metaphor, but there's there yeah, almost always more than one driver for a mm -hmm. story, more than one inspiration. Because if you only go from one thing, you're unlikely to come up with anything very right. original. Sure, sure. So I know you de dedicated the book to Anne, your wife, oh, yeah, yeah. Though, which is wonderful. But Adam, you know, our protagonist, and it's it's told in his voice. Mm. You know, he he like you in a way, IT consultant. Some yeah. of this is is kind of you and um, it's Melbourne, and and that where the story begins, and it starts 22 years before, and he's a piano bar player. Yeah, um, which I'm not. I know. Well, that's what well, my well, other question. Okay, you that, played that's, the that's piano. A big question. I mean, pe yeah. people people yeah. say, well, since he's an IT guy by day, which is your old job, and in fact the same specialty. Right. Why? Because I know yeah. that, so I wasn't going to get anything wrong making him a database designer. Right. Um, they said, well, obviously he's you, and you know, even sophisticated people like interviewers on radio. I remember getting texted before a radio interview that said, "We'll have a piano in the studio. Are you happy to play something?" <laughs> and I had to go. I don't play piano. I've got <laughs> So, so there was a bit of me in Adam Sharp. Yeah. There was a little bit of a good friend of mine who plays piano. Yeah. There was obviously a little bit of Anne's ex-boyfriend from, from the UK. Yeah. So he comes from Manchester and so on. There's a bit of a guy I know in Canada who plays regular pub quiz. So you know, a lot of that goes into the mix. Sure, all these little pieces come together. To well, to well I write as yeah. much as I can from experience. Yeah, but right. obviously you don't want to write a sort of Romana Clay where, where you're... Where you're um, You've got real people, and you're playing a guessing game as to who they are. Right. Um, what I'm, you know, what I'm trying to do is create original characters out of the bits and pieces that I that I see mm -hmm. out there in the world. Yeah, and and you know that that big question in the book, you know, that what if, you know, yeah. what if, yeah. if I had been with this person all these yeah. years, and and not, you know, 22 years before. But it's also, you know, it kind of makes you think about the what ifs in life in general. You know, like what if I had done this, or what if I hadn't done that. Or it's it's just I think it, but it's it's a lot of those questions that have to do with the relationships that we have in life. Well, you know, when you set out to write a book, um, I think most writers would say the same thing. You don't set out saying I have a message or even I have a yeah, theme. Right. You set out to tell a story in a space that you're interested in and that you might feel passionate about. But you don't say through this novel I will convince people that our treatment of indigenous people is bad or, or anything like that sure. or people will feel they're being hit over the head. So I didn't really know what the novel was about until I finished it. And yes. what I think it's about, if you want to use that word, for me anyway, is about how we deal with the past. Um, and there's a number of threads mm -hmm. in there. For example, Adam's mother has led him to romanticize his absent father. She doesn't want him to hate him, and she's a very noble woman in that sense, and says, no, he was a good guy, and somebody really wasn't. Yeah. And so she deals with the past that way. Um, this is how primarily how Adam deals with um, a relationship which he has um, with Angelina, this lover he had in Australia, right. Right. Um, who he's decided was the great love of his yeah. life, right. and you know, how he deals with that in the present when he's in a somewhat dull long-term relationship, and how his long-term partner deals with 
her childhood where she didn't have a lot of love from her mother. So all those sorts of themes sure, come in. Yeah, right. And sort of that, you know, that, that way in which we romanticize things from the past sometimes. And maybe in reality, they're a little different. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, right. But, um, but Angelina Brown, who yeah. he meets when he's playing the piano, and she walks up to the piano and asks him, you know, do you know Because the Night? That's right, the yeah. Patti Smith song. Or... Yeah, the Patti Smith song that Bruce Springsteen wrote. But um, there's so many great songs in this. And, and what was great was reading it, and you, you read the name of the songs or it's talked about, and then it's going through your head. Well, and then you catch yourself later in the day whistling that song or even well, singing well, you're, that song. Well, you, you are my perfect, you are my perfect <laughs> reader then because it's not going to work yeah. for everybody. Right. And, and, but what I wanted to do, because um, I come out of a screenwriting background, and you know how some movies... Um, yeah, the soundtrack is sometimes more important than the story. Yeah, it has right. more survival value. I think of things like um, The Big Chill, with, sure. with all due respect to the story and so on there. Yeah. Um, and even a sort of heart film like Run, Lola, Run, that, yeah, the soundtrack is such a crucial part of it. Right. And I wanted to write a, a novel where you heard the music and, and without using multimedia tricks or anything like that. So what I ended up doing was naming popular songs right. um, and hopefully weaving them into the story. So it's not as though you sort of suddenly interrupt a paragraph sure. and say, imagine that this song was playing here, yeah. but rather, as you say, she comes into the bar, he's playing piano, so that, that gives me yeah. a base for these yeah. things. Is do you know because the night, and he plays that, and then she plays another song, and, and so on. Um, and, I mean, the trick was to come up with songs that enough people would know. I mm -hmm. didn't want this to be full of obscurities that people right. would have to download a soundtrack. And I ended up using classic rock, not you know, 60s and 70s music primarily, mm -hmm. not because, um, not only because that's sort of my era, yeah. um, but because it's everywhere. It, sure. You can't go through life without hearing Hey Jude or whatever, um, or Satisfaction or like a Rolling Stone. Uh, right. And, and then a few songs from other times, mean, everybody knows um, I Will Survive, those, those sorts of things. Yeah. So I wove them in as much as possible. Yeah. Um, but, you know, hopefully you, you hear it on the page and yeah, adds that little right. bit of extra. All right. So, you know, it's, it's the songs and you have the great playlist that you list them all on the back of the book. But um, the songs within the book just fit in so perfectly. It wasn't like you had inserted them where they didn't work. So, yeah. Well, that, that was the first criterion. Yeah. Yeah. The first thing I wanted with a song was it had to fit. Right. The second was that it needed to be as much as possible within that first one familiar to people. Yeah. I didn't want to put too many obscurities in, as I said. Yeah. And the third was that I'd like to like it. So if I had a few choices, I'd pick the one I liked best. But yeah. a couple of times, there were none that I liked, and it had to be something I didn't. Yeah. But it's funny how uh, one song can mean something very different to another person. But it's also those songs when you do fall in love, or those songs that you, you know where you heard it, where you were when you heard it for that first time. And, and uh, you, you know, like this that. is the difference in some ways. Yeah. I think, you yeah, know, they say that with a book, that you know, the writer is only 50% and the reader brings the, the other half to it. But I think it's even more so in the case of a song. I think um, yeah, there's, a, a, look, there's a lot of agreement about what books are, are loved and so forth. Mm -hmm. Songs can be tremendously personal. The, the, the first song that's explicitly mentioned in the book is Hey Jude. And you know, it's a pretty innocuous song, I think. But yeah. you know, I had one reader who just said they had to put the book down and walk away and come back to it because I hate that song so much it was going to spoil their enjoyment of the book. Ooh. So I was aware that I couldn't use songs to manipulate the reader's emotions, that, that the story had to do that as it were, right, um, sure. and the songs would be there and they could, they could associate them, but I couldn't use them as, the, as a direct path to their hearts as it were. Right, right. Um, but I did love the playlist in the back. But you know, it's, it's, it's interesting how songs have such nostalgia for, for everyone and you you think of those songs from your childhood you think of those songs when you were young and you were you know maybe when you were 20s or your teens or I even remember my grandmother telling me about songs that she loved and she would sing them and those might have been songs from the 20s or the 30s you know but just incredible how music really just makes us so nostalgic for certain things that were going on in our lives. Oh absolutely uh, we associate yeah. them with the moment and my my goal with the book was to have you know, exactly what's happened with you, that you hear a song on the radio now and you'll remember that scene from, from Adam Sharp and how that song played. Yeah, and I think this book also too was, was that, that whole thing about second chances. And, and then also the question, we got to watch, there's no spoilers because we, we don't want to tell how this book ends. Well, well look, I'll, but, I'll, I'll, yeah. put, I'll put it to you, cause I, yeah. I, without being a spoiler, yeah. at, the, at the end of the day, Adam has got 
is in a relationship, somebody from his past who was the true great love, the romantic love. Mm -hmm. So he's got romantic love coming back from the past and he's got what you might call companionate love that's been happening for a long time. Yeah. And he, at the end of the book, he's going to have to choose. Right. Um, and that's why it's a difficult, it's a difficult book for some people right. because it's you know, older, he's older, he's in his 40s and there are no simple choices anymore. Right. Relationships are complicated, you've been through stuff and there will be no answer for Adam that, that checks all the buttons, it's like sort of cuts the Gordian knot and says everything's solved, right, which right. is what Don Tillman and the Rosie books would do. Yeah, exactly. Well, he would have to do it very scientifically, you know, yeah. with all that. Um, but, you know, when you, I've heard you talk about this, but, you know, writing, you wrote screenplays. You've written a lot of, you know, short film screenplays um, and, and technical writing and all those types of things. But um, going from a screenplay and then writing short stories, you know, how, how difficult was for you, and you mentioned that when you were writing The Rosie Project, to write a full-length novel and to write in prose. Was that, was that a difficult transition for you? Well, you know what it, what it is? The, the screenplay gave me the structural tools to write a full-length novel. So for me, the full-length novel wasn't the challenge, which it is for a lot of new writers. They can write 2,000 words of beautiful prose, but can't structure the 85,000 words of a novel. For me, the sure. problem was the opposite. Having studied screenwriting, I knew how to structure a story. Yeah. And you know, yeah. the, the Rosie Project is very much a three-act you know, structure. Yeah. You just about tick the pages where it happens, yeah. hopefully not too, too visibly, yeah. but it's structured like a screenplay. And, and you know, the other books are different, but I know, what I, I know what I'm doing, and I know about structure. My real concern was prose, and that's why I wrote the short stories. I wrote the short stories to exercise ah, prose. Right. That and, makes sense. And I look yeah. to get feedback to see whether I could do it. Yeah. Yeah, whether anybody would publish them and yeah. yeah so you wrote a lot of short stories but but the whole thing with it was so interesting because you wrote the screenplay mm. and then you wrote the novel yeah. of the rosie project and then you wrote the screenplay from the novel because it was very different I no, no, no 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 oh no but i they... never wrote the screenplay from the novel so I, I wrote the screenplay first right then and i wrote the novel, novel and then i edited the screenplay so i went okay. back okay Knowing, you know, knowing yeah. what refinements I put in the yeah. novel and so right. on. So I guess it influenced it, but not the big way. Yeah. So, um, but tell us about the, the whole journey from um, the time that you wrote the screenplay and then getting it to a publisher and writing the book for The Rosie Project. And what was that experience like for you compared to what it was like, you know, with the best mm -hmm. of Adam, Sh Adam Sharp? Because that's, you're worth a new publisher now, oh, but a completely different kind of, you're, you're an experienced now oh. novelist and getting books published. Look, I, I think what I'd say is that most aspiring novelists don't set their goals any higher than getting published by a mainstream publisher. Um, and that was my goal. And when I got that offer to publish, and not for a lot of money by any means um, for the, uh, in the first time round, um, I said to myself, Graham, you've achieved this, this goal. Everything else is, I'm not sure whether you Americans say gravy or cream, um, <laughs> but it, you yeah. It's, well, gravy. We use gravy more, but I okay. think cream too. <laughs> Everything else is gravy. Yeah. It's extra. Right. So yeah. you, Graham, tell yourself now, if you make it to number two, but not to number one on the New York Times bestseller list, you will not get upset and, and rant against um, Donna Tart, which is what happens. <laughs> <laughs> or, yeah, right. well, I, well, only for five minutes. Yeah. Um, yeah, right. yeah, because, because you've got it. You've got what you wanted. Right. Um, so... But I mean, it's enormous excitement in being published right, right. the first time. And, and obviously once you've done it once and you've had some success. But I, look, I've, I've enjoyed lots and lots of steps along the way, including getting some of my short films on television, even getting good feedback from people about stories. Right. So I was, didn't expect, you know, as a screenwriter starting off, that I would ever get a film made, a movie made. I mean, that was my goal, but yeah. it was a stretch goal. And it wasn't my expectation. So I thought, I've got to enjoy all the stages in this journey. Otherwise, I'm going to end up you know, sad and bitter. And as it right. turned out, I had probably more successes than I expected. Yeah. And when the Rosie Project came out, it was, it was the number one pick of independent booksellers when it came out. So that was... Yeah, look, it got a, it got a yeah. great run. Oh, my goodness, um, yeah. I've been right. obviously astonished. I think we sold about three million around the world yeah. in 40 odd countries. Oh, and, so, and, and yeah, so many languages that it's been translated. Yeah, into. look, I mean, yeah. it's, been, it's been astonishing. It was way right. beyond my wildest expectations, and that's, yeah. and that's lovely. But I don't expect Adam Sharp to do the same. I didn't... You know, yeah, right. You, well, you then, don't know. Your own... Yeah, sure. You've got to measure success in lots of different ways, yeah. and I might the book that I'm happiest with might be the least best-selling, right. or you know, 
or the least awarded or, or whatever it might be. There's many dimensions of success. Right. Now, you were on the business side of things before you, you did a lot of this in the, in the tech field. And how did, and you wrote some technical books. You know, yeah, a when couple, you, yeah. Yeah. So how, how did all that, that career, and I know you sold your company and, and then ended up you know, getting, writing screenplays mm. and short stories and all that. How did that experience of your life inform your, your writing now today? Okay, the, the most the most important thing it did. I mean, it, it's look, it's provided me with with anecdotes, with with all sorts of material and so on. It's given me a, a business sort of pragmatism about things. So I'm not you know I don't have an agent. I just deal direct with my publisher because I'm used to doing that that sort of thing. Um, I'll tell you the most important thing. I think it's relevant to aspiring writers. I knew how long it had taken me and how much work it had taken me to get to where I got in my profession, which was a long time. And I figured it was going to take me that long and that amount of effort um, to make it, um, because there's more jobs around for database designers or business managers as I became mm -hmm. than there are for successful novelists. And I think that work ethic, um, I'm going to sort of show off about this, but I worked considerably harder than most of the fellow students and that around me, not because I'm a good guy or anything, but because I figured I wouldn't make it if I didn't. And it, it translates to into, as I say, a get it done sort of work ethic. Um, you know, I meet my deadlines, yeah. which is, is not common in our game. The first time I met a deadline well, for the book, I handed in a, the redraft and I really sweated to get it done. I'd yeah. really gone crazy yeah. to get this thing on time, put it on my editor's desk and he said, oh, it'll be three weeks or so before I get to that. There was a she back then, and she, yeah. and she said, and I said, well, why? You know, I, I busted myself <laughs> to get right. this thing. Yeah. Just, well, people don't deliver on time normally. I said, no, <laughs> that's when you always hear, oh, I have so, okay, a deadline, so, and I'm so not going to make So let's, let's get this straight. Right. If I'm not going to deliver on time, I'll let you know in advance. Because yeah. yeah, in my old job, if I didn't deliver on time, right. I'm in big trouble. Yeah, so you're rare in the author, author world by turning yourself on time. So I want to know what, with um, outlining. And, yeah. and, and like you said, you know, writing, writing a screenplay, you know what the, the beginning, the middle, and the end is. But with, do you outline when you do a, a complete novel? You bet. Um, I, do, I use the same planning technique, or just a slightly modified version okay. of it, um, as I did in screenwriting. And that's not my invention. It's what most screenwriters do. They do the cards. They lay it out one card per scene. Now, a book is not all scenes. A book includes description, a book includes summary, so you have to modify the technique a little bit for that. But I lay it out on about 120 or so cards and say, this is the shape of the book, and that then gets transferred into a, a document which becomes a, a fleshier outline. So by the time I sit down to write, I know where everything's going. And in fact, you know, I just work through, I'm looking at writer's block at this stage, because you know, if it gets too, if, if I get blocked, I just lower my standards and keep going because I know I'm going to come back and edit. Sure, sure. Yeah, I mean, that's, yeah. that's the opposite to yeah. someone like, I mean, Zadie Smith has written very perceptively and reflectively about her own writing process. Yeah. And it's the opposite. You know, she sits down, she writes a bit like Hemingway says, write one true sentence and then, yeah. And then keep, it, the next and the next, yeah. right. But yeah. I would not, look, I would say to an aspiring writer, try that. But if it doesn't work for you, if you keep getting to 30,000 words and get lost and so on, try planning. I, I'm not going to say it to Zadie Smith, because it clearly, work, <laughs> clearly it works no. for her, but yeah, right. there's a lot of people it doesn't work for. And yeah. to them, I would say, try planning. Yeah. So Sony Pictures, you know, bought yeah. option the rights for the Rosie Project. Where is that? Because I think it's, it's in development, and I know there are a couple of actors that sort of, and a director who have been sort of assigned to that movie, and I know something's changed. But when, when, do, you, when do you think we'll see that movie? Because a lot of people are, can't wait to see okay. the movie. It's been a roller coaster. We, yeah. you know, we had Jennifer Lawrence attached for a while. We had Richard Linklater attached. We had we've had a number of, of excellent time. Um, Lord Miller as directors, you know, top top people attached to the movie. I can't be explicit at the moment, right. but we sure. have a new director, um, unofficially at least attached. I okay. utterly love him. It's a male, and I, you know, and I've made it very clear to Sony that yes, please do not let this guy get away because <laughs> he, he's terrific. Yeah. And the picture I have at the moment is that they are pushing very hard to get some action on this sooner rather than later. Sure. And, and I know that there was a, a very important meeting just a couple of days ago Go about casting. So it, it's, look, my picture is they really want to make this movie. And, and it's just developed with this guy on board, 
a new lease of energy, a new impetus. Oh, good. And I'm I'm feeling very very bullish about something happening in the next uh, next few weeks. Ooh. Okay. Tell us. What's like an announcement. Yeah. Okay. So, is okay. My other question was okay. Before we go to that, well, it would be great if the Rosie Project comes out and then they would make a movie of the Rosie Effect. Well, yeah, look, and you know how yeah, these things I work. Know, if know. the Rosie Project's a success, then right. um, there's very likely to be a sequel, and the obvious sequel to make is the Rosie Effect, right. although not necessarily right. so, yeah. but, but I would think so. Right. So how about a movie for The Best of Adam Sharp? Will there be a movie? I'm, I'm very, very hopeful that there will be a movie. Okay. Um, we, have some, we have an option now for, the, uh, for it to be made. Um, it's just been announced, and... Um, yeah, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm looking forward to that. I'm really excited. Oh, that'd be great because that soundtrack is already right there. That would be just incredible. Well, yeah. that's right. And because it's, a, and I don't think it's going to be a massive rights yeah. issue as often is to actually get the music because mm -hmm. it will be whoever plays Adam you know, or Angelina, the two actually singing and playing yeah. and so on, those songs themselves. So, that, so it's, it should be feasible yeah. to do it. Oh, that'll be great. Okay. And what are you working on now? Because I, I heard something you're working on something with, with your wife here. Yeah, no, done. Ah. <laughs> so so I'm, not work, I'm not working on it anymore. I'm, okay, well, uh, all right. I exaggerate a little, but this okay. morning, this morning, I sent off the second round of edits to the proofs, which is about the end of the, of the line. Right. Um, so that's, it's being typeset. So the new book is called Two Steps Forward. Um, it's a romantic comedy, uh, back to the roots. Yeah. Set on the Camino de Santiago de Compostela, famous pilgrims walk in France and Spain, you know, mm -hmm. Spain and France. Um, if people have seen Martin Sheen's um, movie The Way, or Emilio Estevez's movie The Way, it's, okay. it's in that sort of region on a different route. Right. Um, and it's co-written with my wife. Yeah. So we wrote alternate chapters. She wrote The Woman's Voice. The woman's an American um, recent widow who's walking this very long distance walk, you know, 1200 miles it turns out, walking this very long distance walk um, in order to get her head back together to come to terms with the grief. Okay. Yeah. A very, very spiritual journey for her. And the male protagonist is a British engineer who's invented a cart that you pull behind you instead of a backpack. And he's walking the Camino to try to raise some, some money after he gave it all to his lousy ex-wife. <laughs> Okay. So, oh, that sounds great. So when can we expect to see that? Any, any idea? We've got a publication date for Australia, which is October. Okay. Um, still not clear on U.S. publication. Okay. All right. Well, we'll hope to see it in 2018 then, I hope. I would think that's what it'll be. Yeah, yeah. it'll be great. And <laughs> Graham, thank you so much for sitting down with me. It was a real pleasure. And congratulations on your new book, The Best of Adam Sharp. Terrific talking to you to Becky. And look, can I just put in a little commercial at the end? Um, I am... Yeah, so indebted to um, to independent bookstores. They continue to, I'd like to see them continue to thrive, but they were the people who got me started with the Rosie Project yeah. and continue to provide these sort of community centers where I can, I can do these things. Yeah. So well, you, you thank make, you. You make it a joy for us. You really do. Oh, thank Thanks. You. Fantastic and fun conversation with Graham Simpson, Australian author of the New York Times bestseller, The Rosie Project. And he's here with his new novel. It's called The Best of Adam Sharp. Thanks for joining me on Authors Revealed.